Okay, so welcome everyone. We're going to have people trickle in as they are realizing that the link has been updated and as they see their emails. But I wanted to thank you guys for making it to today's workshop. This is going to be a workshop about NFTs and how artists can utilize this new tool and service to help better their uh, sharing with their art and to help monetize more opportunities for their art. Um, and today we have Miss Lisa Stewart. She is the global head of marketing for Zine and she is here to help us understand a little bit more about the NFT craze and we are going to go into a little bit of information about how we all can access this information, how we can engage. Um, while we are having the presentation today, uh, I will be taking notes for questions and we will have reserved time at the end for a nice Q&A section. With that being said, let's go ahead and give a round of applause for Ms. Lisa Stewart. Thank you, thank you. And I will go ahead and allow her to take the reins. In the meantime, I'll be adding more participants. Thank you, Lisa, and you're good to go when you're ready. All right, I am going to attempt to share my screen. Um, I just wanted to see right now if everybody has the ability to see uh, my screen and it should say NFTs for Artists, a GCAC workshop. Um, am I getting some head nods? Great, Whew, thank you. That is the hardest part and it is out of the way. Um, first off, I wanted to thank everybody for joining me today and also give a big shout out and a thank you to GCAC for inviting me um, to participate in this workshop uh, and kind of help guide artists um, through the Columbus space and beyond um, into this kind of brave new world of art ownership of art creation um, and of arts marketing so it kind of covers a lot of different topics. Um, as I mentioned, uh, if you had had piped in before, um, I'm going to go through this uh, presentation. I'm not great at multitasking, so I won't be able to really view the chat right away, um, but I will try to leave as much room as possible towards the end uh, for any questions that folks might have. So again, hi, uh, my name is Lisa. Um, I've been supporting the Columbus Arts for over 15 years here in Columbus. Um, my background is in fine arts. I went to school for fine arts and then found my way through various art institutions, either marketing at an arts uh, college. Um, I've been volunteering at 934 for the last five uh, or six years at this point, and I currently sit on the advisory board at 934 Gallery. Um, and then in the last year, I have switched industries over from um, working in arts um, marketing for an educational institution to now working in arts marketing for an art tech startup, um, which brings us to our topic today, which is NFTs. Um, and just, you know, what makes me worthy enough to talk about this? Uh, I don't want to say that any particular person needs to come to a, to a conversation like today with X amount of NFTs that are worth, you know, X amount of Ethereum, um, things like that aren't going to impress me too much. Um, I can tell you that I went ahead and took the dive into buying my first NFT in October of 2021 um, and continued to buy throughout the winter. Um, I've kind of slowed down momentarily and we'll go into a little bit of why that is um, a little bit later on, but um, my experience and what makes me able to come and talk to you today is uh, that I, I took the dive. I, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could. And now I kind of exist in this art space here in Columbus to um, speak about NFTs to other artists who are willing to listen. So just a disclaimer for everyone here. Um, this panel really is about the curious and open minds um, that want to learn some basics about NFTs. I am not here, nor will I ever be here to try and convince an artist that they need to make an NFT, nor do I want to convince you that you need to buy an NFT. Really, I just want to present all the facts as they are um, and let you come to your own conclusions as to whether or not you want to make or purchase one. And it is okay to change your mind. So, you know, what is an NFT? Of course, uh, I want to say over the last six months, even seven months throughout 2022, they become even more top of mind and more top of um, news outlets than ever before. Uh, 2021 kind of saw the beginning surge of NFT popularity. Um, and now in 2022, we're starting to see more and more companies jump on, more and more brands jump on, and celebrities also begin to jump onto NFT craze. 
you uh, hang out in Twitter spaces at all, you'll probably see a lot of NFT projects um, being mentioned from really both ends of the aisle too. Like you'll have your um, NFT skeptics out there as well as your NFT enthusiasts. And uh, often there is not a lot of space in the middle for those two to have conversation. And what I'd like for us to all do here again is to be um, open-minded and leave room for that conversation to develop. Um, so at its most sort of elevated realm, if you want to get into the artist statement of an NFT, I want to say that an NFT symbolizes belonging. It symbolizes community and ownership too. Um, so an NFT can be in one sense, a ticket to unlocking something that's greater than any one of us can achieve on our own. And I know that seems very, very lofty. Like I said, this is my artist statement version of what is an NFT. Um, but first, I think that we need to back up a little bit and go with some basics. Uh, so the next few slides, I'm going to be going over some basic terminology with you. Um, if you are familiar with these things, it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of a refresher. If these are brand new for you, also don't stress if it doesn't click for you right away. Sometimes it took me several times of reading articles, watching YouTube videos before the concept and the building blocks of NFTs really kind of hit for me. So speaking of those building blocks, the mechanics behind NFTs, no lie. Everything can be a little complicated and a bit obtuse. Um, I think a lot of creators uh, and collectors out there feel a little bit left behind um, with this new technology. They just think um, this is too much. I don't know where to begin. Um, I'm hearing words and terminology that I've never heard before. Uh, it's overwhelming. So I hear you, that's totally valid. Um, the, the space is not easy to onboard with, but hopefully um, I've spent a lot of time in the last year really breaking down some of the basics and hopefully this terminology um, is in its most simplified state. So starting with the building blocks, we're gonna start with blockchain technology. Uh, so blockchain is really just an immutable decentralized open ledger. Um, it stores a record of transactions in a digital format, and that information can be grouped together, um, known as a block. So blockchain, block. This group of information is a block, and that um, it has a specific storage capacity. <clears throat> Once that has been hit, um, a new uh, that block closes and a new block is added, um, hence blockchain. Um, this type of chain kind of forms an irreversible ledger of data, too when implemented in a decentralized structure, decentralized meaning that there's no one um, authority that is, is governing this entire blockchain. So also what is appealing to a lot of people who are into cryptocurrency or who are into sort of like blockchain technology is the fact that it is immutable as well. Um, that means it can't be changed. And then it's also in a sense, very open. Um, one can go through and any one of us um, given the appropriate tool can go through and look at all the information that exists on chain. So a smart contract, this is the second big word that I think I really want artists to know, um, especially as they sit down and potentially talk about um, NFT projects with a, a creator or with somebody that wants to create an NFT project with that artist. I want you to know about smart contracts. Um, smart contracts actually predate NFTs um, by quite a bit. Uh, they are really just a digital protocol for information, information transfer. Um, they basically eliminate the need for any middleman to establish efficiency and trust in the execution of a contract. Um, I think that the uh, graphic on the side that I shamelessly stole from a site um, really highlights kind of it in its most simplistic way. Um, there are two parties involved. One wants to exchange money for something. The other one wants to collect money in exchange for that something. A smart contract exists to execute that without the need for any other third party system or person to be involved. Um, the smart contracts associated with NFTs specifically are coded in a programming language called Solidity, and they assign ownership of the NFT. Um, again, once the code is deployed, it's immutable, meaning it can no longer be um, changed and it is open as well. So anybody can comb through a smart contract to see what uh, stipulations exist in that contract. How much is the artist getting paid 
both in primary and secondary sales. Um, again, what's really appealing to some folks about NFTs is the smart contract. And I also think that a lot of folks who kind of sit more on the dissenting side of NFTs aren't really familiar with the technology behind NFTs. And by that technology, I mean the smart contract specifically. All right, so hard stuff, hard stuff out of the way. Um, what does non-fungible even really mean? So I think simply put, it just means that the item or in this case, the token, so the NFT is a non-fungible token, uh, cannot be exchanged for something of the exact same value. So think about dollar bills. Um, I can exchange one dollar bill for another dollar bill. I can ask you, hey, I have this dollar. It's got some rips and tears in it and it won't, like the, men, the vending machine won't accept it. Can I ask you for a crisper dollar bill? You're not gonna look at that dollar bill and say, well, that dollar bill is only worth 97 cents. Um, no, a dollar is one for one. Um, where the assets in question like diamonds or trading cards are non-fungible in nature. So non-fungible does exist out in the real world, not just in this new digital realm. Um, a diamond, um, there's no one diamond that is exactly like the other. They all have their unique clarity, their unique marks. Same with trading cards. I kind of like to use Pokemon as an example in this. Each card, um, even though they all might visually look the same, like this Charizard card, is gonna have little dents and dings and scratches in it that might affect its value. So you can't really change them one for one. Um, people will, on the dissenting side of NFTs, argue these days that um, an NFT is nothing more than a receipt. Ooh, it's a receipt of something. I mean, they're not wrong. Um, they're actually very close to the truth, but they're so close to it that um, it's almost as if uh, they're just not open enough more to understanding, like, what does that receipt really mean? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a proof of ownership. Um, it's, it's not so much always about the visual that is represented in an NFT, um, of which we will go into the aesthetics a bit later, but what does that NFT represent? What can you gain access with with that NFT? What does that open you up to if you own that NFT? And that's kind of where this new realm of arts creation can um, push creatives further. And that's really what I would like to do with creatives is, is kind of push their understanding of art, art creation a little bit beyond. So I know we're getting through the hard parts right now. We're about to few more terms I would like to add to this conversation um, for you to know. One is minting. Um, you may, if you have looked into uh, creating your own NFT, have seen that you would be minting an NFT. This describes the process of validating the information that is creating the new block and recording that information onto that blockchain that we were talking about. So that, that block um, is full of different types of information. Minting an NFT means that you are minting that onto the block and that information is now stored. It's becoming a part of the public ledger. So it exists, it's unchangeable, it's tamper-proof. Again, that is one of the selling points for NFTs. There's also lazy minting though. So um, in this method, like an artist can mint an NFT without having to pay for the gas, of which I will explain gas momentarily. Um, associated with that specific transaction. The metadata for the NFT is created without actually adding it to uh, the NFT itself. So um, basically you do all of the legwork, but then you don't quite add it to the blockchain yet. Um, typically that is rolled into the purchase that maybe a, a collector is looking to do. So instead of the artist paying for the NFT, the collector then gets kind of passed along that cost. And so now we're talking a little bit about cost. I mentioned a term called gas, which um, might be new to some of you. Gas is really, um, think about is the, the, the fee that you need to, to mint or to create an NFT. When conducting a transaction or executing a contract on the Ethereum blockchain specifically, um, you must pay gas to successfully complete your action. Um, it's a transaction fee essentially and it gets paid out to the miners who are compensated for the energy that it takes to verify each transaction. 
Um, additionally, this is meant to add a layer of security to the Ethereum uh, chain by making it too expensive to spam the network. If anybody in this room has ever tried to purchase an NFT um, and has experienced absorbent gas fees or something sometimes called a gas war that takes place, um, it feels a little too real, I think, with our current, well, you know, I've been in NFTs for a little too long when people were complaining about like real world gas prices and I'm just thinking about NFT gas prices. Um, there have been times before where I've logged in to like mint an NFT and the cost of the gas, uh, that is the cost of the transaction fee, um, costs more than the NFT itself. So uh, that information fluctuates almost by the second and gets updated constantly. So oftentimes you can wait around a little bit until the gas drops and then you have a better transaction fee. All right. So this feels complicated. I've tossed around a lot of words like blockchain and solidity and smart contract. And you're sitting to yourself, um, look, I'm a photographer, I'm a painter. Um, I, I don't know how to code. Like this is, this like I, I'm out, right? Like I'm done. I don't know how to do NFTs, you've lost me. Well, hopefully I didn't lose you just yet. There are a lot of easy to mint resources available for artists um, there that the third party will take care of all of that contracting and that minting and that coding for you. Um, the top three OpenSea, Rarible and Binance exist. Um, just sort of anybody can go and create a profile and make an NFT. Uh, the bottom three, Super Rare, Nifty Gateway and Foundation that is either by invitation or an application process. So as an artist, you might want to begin thinking about if um, that's the, the space that you wanna go. Um, a super rare Nifty Gateway and Foundation have some beautifully curated um, collections as well. So if you kind of really want to elevate your fine art into um, NFT fine art, and you want to then potentially use one of these uh, third-party systems like Super Rare, Nifty Gateway, or Foundation, you might want to start thinking um, ahead about marketing yourself as an NFT or as a digital artist to kind of help with that application process. But worst case scenario, there's also a lot of discords out there now that um, focus on building NFT communities specifically to onboard traditional artists into um, Web3. So, uh, don't, don't despair. There's plenty of opportunity out there, even if you don't know how to code. So let's talk about a simplified NFT workflow now. Um, you uh, maybe have an idea. Um, you know that you want to create something that will exist as an NFT that can become purchasable. My biggest um, hope is that you kind of let your ideas be larger than life. Um, explore this new medium in every way that you can create something um, and then go about, you know, figuring out how you're going to execute it. Maybe it's building a team, maybe it's using OpenSea, um, but it can be, it can be large. It can be story-based. It can be, um, you know, a, a large marketing campaign, or it can be as simple as I just want to test this out, but let your ideas kind of just come to you. It can be more than just a, a JPEG or a GIF in the sense of um, what it represents. So once you have your idea, you'll need to create the work, right? So the visual image that symbolizes your NFT um, can be represented in anything. It can be uh, 3D photography, painting, um, literally it can be like a real life painting that you then take a high quality photo of and then use that as the visual representation of what your NFT is. And I keep using this word as visual representation because if you listened earlier when I said like it's a receipt that stands for something bigger, it can be, this is the visual representation that says that you're in this private club that I'm now creating, right? Or this can be the visual representation of um, an event that now only you're invited to because you own this NFT. So that's what I mean by kind of pushing it further, right? Like this is kind of conceptual. So once you create your work, you need to set up a crypto wallet. And so this is kind of the, again, this is sometimes where we lose people in this creation process. 
Um, so currently the NFT process requires onboarding onto cryptocurrencies and using a crypto wallet to do any transaction on chain. And again, like I said, um, when you're dealing with like the Ethereum chain to do any transaction on that chain, you have to pay gas, which means that you have to have some amount of Ethereum to begin with. Um, there's a lot of easy onboarding tools these days. Um, they are trying to make this uh, more simple for folks. So uh, it's, it's available out there. Um, I think that I use Coinbase as my uh, space to just buy Ethereum and then I transfer it to my crypto wallet and I make purchases based off of that. Um, then you can choose whatever chain you wish to mint on. Um, so there are different types of chains out there. I mentioned Ethereum, uh, but there are other chains out there. Each chain kind of has its own benefits to it and its own pitfalls. And so really the best advice that I can offer you as an artist is to do sort of the comparison research. Um, is this chain popular with a specific type of art? Is this chain more environmentally friendly than another chain? Um, does this chain offer something that another one does not? And so you're going to want to explore and find the one that you think works best for you and your potential collectors as well. After that, your work Oh, sorry. Apologies. Uh, uh, Lisa, you're muted. You're good. You're good. Thank you. I got it. Um, all right. So now your work exists as an NFT um, and now whatever it also represents, right? Again, that concept of representation of um, is this NFT a ticket to something bigger? Is it um, access to a specific members only club? Um, whatever that is, it can't be deleted, it lives on chain now. And you can sell your NFT if you'd like. You can sell it, um, mint it directly from your site. So uh, if you wanted, you have your own artist website out, you wanna send people to mint directly on your site, um, you have that opportunity. Um, this would be one of those spaces where I think that the technology and the ability to onboard artists is getting better. So you might be able to find somebody who could easily help you kind of create that space on your website, or you can use one of those third-party spaces too, like OpenSea or Super Rare um, or Binance to um, start selling your NFT. All right, um, so I did see some questions that popped in before uh, we started this workshop. There were some questions that were collected or just some comments. I saw a lot of questions about NFTs and their relation to cryptocurrencies and how they might relate to one another. Um, there is a two hour long documentary out there um, that you may or may not have seen um, or have been told to watch by your friends and especially very popular amongst um, people who are uh, sort of NFT skeptics. It's called Line Goes Up. It's a two hour YouTube documentary. Um, I, I watched it because I wanted to hear some of the dissenting opinions and I wanted to understand a little bit more about um, my friends out there who aren't in NFTs, where they might be coming from. And so the person does say that NFTs only exist to drive up the price of cryptocurrencies, um, which is where I think maybe some of these questions might've been coming from. So cryptocurrency and NFTs do share a common parent, right? They are all based on blockchain. That is their commonality. Um, NFTs are considered a crypto asset, but they are not a cryptocurrency. They're non-fungible again in nature. Um, they cannot be exchanged the way currency can be in a one-to-one -one relationship. So again, as I talked earlier about the dollar, um, one for one dollar, uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum can be exchanged on sort of that one-for-one -one basis. But also NFTs do not necessarily possess monetary value, though they can hold value. And this is where I kind of draw some correlation lines back to traditional forms of art. Um, a beautiful painting by a friend uh, can be valuable to me, but that doesn't necessarily mean it has value on the market. And the same with NFTs. Also, cryptocurrency um, like Bitcoin and Ethereum are fungible, I just mentioned. And then I also wanted to point out that um, 
for that criticism that uh, NFTs exist only to drive up the price of current cryptocurrencies, that some platforms actually no longer require crypto to purchase NFTs. Um, so there are some platforms out there where you can use fiat, that is a traditional currency, to purchase um, NFTs, and you will, don't need to onboard uh, and, and buy Ethereum to do so. So uh, that is kind of my, you know, uh, that maybe at one point that person in that documentary maybe had a, a small point, but at this point, um, I think also as this market, as the NFT market um, grows and people are vocal about their dissenting opinions, that gives the space a chance to grow and change as well to meet the market. So my TLDR there on correlation, um, the quote here says, looking at the data, there does not appear to be a consistent correlation between OpenSea sales volume and ETH price. Um, it appears that NFTs are relatively independent market and may for the most part move separately from the rest of the crypto market. Um, and then I added my little two cents out there and that the tr honestly, the truth is, is that we're still too early to tell if there is a correlation. Right now, um, the uh, data pool on this is just a couple of years and um, monetary systems have been in place for hundreds of thousands of years, hundreds of years at the very least. So it's a little difficult right now, I think, for us to definitively say that yes or no, NFTs will or only exist to drive up cryptocurrency prices. Um, I think one of the biggest points for that not being the case is the fact that markets, some markets exist out there that now accept fiat and don't require ETH. All right. So I definitely want to pause again to go over some misconceptions about NFTs because I do want to just kind of clear the room. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with friends over the last year, um, very open dialogues, um, and I want to uh, shine a light on some of their concerns. So one of the biggest ones that I hear a lot um, is that NFTs are bad for the environment. Um, so my big, my big takeaway here, hey, your concerns are valid. Um, I'm, I'm sure that some NFT, uh, pro NFT people out there might be shocked to hear me say something along the lines of like, your concerns are valid. I think, again, it's important to acknowledge the criticisms of NFTs um, and to speak up about them, uh, mostly to in order to force change within the industry. Just the way that we speak up about any other brand or any other industry in hopes that change occurs, we should be doing the same for the NFT industry as well. I do want to explain the difference between mining versus minting. We talked a little bit about minting earlier in our dialogue on the various glossary terms. And so mining for cryptocurrencies, such as Bitcoin, that is definitely a root cause for the conversation around crypto and the environment. Mining, yes, is very, uh, produces and consumes a lot of energy. Um, and is responsible for 0.08% of the world's total CO2 emissions. That's not great. That's not great. Um, but however, minting an NFT, the process of adding the NFT to chain is not responsible for that level of emissions. Essentially, the mining has already occurred at that point. Um, NFTs just kind of are using the technology that already exists. There is also something that you can take with you, and that is the concept of proof of work versus proof of stake. Um, this is a little complicated, but the difference here is that different chains use different types of consensus mechanisms to validate the transaction. So for example, you have um, a transaction that you want to do on one chain, um, as in like you want to sell an NFT. Well, in order to sell an NFT that is a transaction, it requires um, a consensus mechanism to validate that. Proof of work, which is currently used by Ethereum, is less energy efficient than proof of stake, um, which is currently used by Matic, also known as Polygon. Um, so there has been a larger push to move NFTs to be minted on proof of stake chains. So as you, as an artist, look towards minting your first NFT, you maybe this concern um, is uh, top for you and you really want to address it, you might choose a chain that uses a proof of stake mechanism, um, therefore being a little bit more environmentally friendly in the process as well. Um, the artwork here on the side too, I wanted to point out um, is an NFT. It's animated um, really beautifully on the site that it came from. It didn't, didn't pull in the animation here, but it's a CO2 compound. Um, it's a carbon compounding artwork 
And so what this is, it's an NFT that is also tied to a climate-based DAO, that's a decentralized autonomous organization. So as this NFT exists, it essentially um, eats up and buys more carbon credits, therefore cleaning the environment as it exists. Um, and so when I talk about high concept work for artists and how I wanna push them more to think um, beyond just a, a cute GIF or um, you know, a, an animated like rabbit or something along those lines, I wanna push artists to think conceptually. What can your NFT do? What can you do with the technology that exists out there? So this artist found a way to essentially buy up carbon credits with the, with the existence of this NFT, therefore cleaning the environment as it exists, which is really cool. So again, there's a TLDR here on carbon footprint. Um, I've got a couple quotes here from two different sources that kind of talk about um, NFTs use is about 3% of the Ethereum's network energy, um, which is a really small, small percentage. When you think about Ethereum, right, that's, that's the blockchain. Um, NFTs only are about 3% of that network's entire energy. Um, YouTube and the entire Ethereum network have a similar carbon footprint, if that helps. So, you know, I hate, I hate to be that person sometimes, but when we think about how we decide to uh, navigate certain industries and what industries we want to put our money and our energy towards, uh, I think it's valuable for us to look at how we also use other industries or other brands or other types of technology. Um, so I think sometimes it's quite easy to point a finger at the new kid in the room and blame them for all the problems. Uh, but the truth is there are a lot of things out there that take up a lot of energy. And I think all of them are worth talking about and worth shining a light on. All right. So now we're kind of getting into the, the meat of this conversation. Uh, maybe you're an artist out there, you're listening, you took in some information. You're starting to understand the tech behind NFTs. You keep hearing me talk about conceptual work and that's maybe sparking a little bit of interest for you. But like, why, why do you wanna create an NFT? Why as an artist, as a creator, would you want to create one? Again, I think that this is a really exciting new uh, medium through which artists can explore ideas to uh, highlight their artistic vision, um, much in the same way that any arts medium was new at one point. Um, you know, photography was not considered an art form for a very long time. Um, printmaking uh, also received some of the same slack, uh, wasn't accepted in fine art circles. Um, there's a lot that says that ceramics falls more into crafts than fine art. Uh, there's uh, conversations around um, digital art before NFTs existed and whether or not they're considered fine art. So the conversation about what is and isn't considered conceptual fine art or high art or just art in general has been going on for decades and decades and decades, probably centuries. Um, and so this nothing new. We're just at a new point in our history. Um, agreed to that it was not the easiest to onboard folks onto. Um, you can consider NFTs potentially to be like your IPO, your initial public offering to your fans and creators or your fans out there. So think of it as potentially a, a membership um, or uh, seed money to fund a larger art project that you want to fund. You know, you can tell people out that I'm releasing a set of 10 NFTs and the money that I make from them will then be used to fund this larger art project. Like it could be a great opportunity for you to raise money in a way that um, maybe feels a little bit cooler than like a Kickstarter or, or, just, or just a Patreon, right? Like people are getting something kind of new with it and that NFT and whatever they hold with that NFT, you can continue to add benefits to it later on if you'd like. It's also a great way for um, conceptual artists or digital artists to go ahead and make money off of their work, right? So um, not saying it's the easiest thing in the world, but a, a person who creates traditional works of art, something that can be um, much like behind me, hung on the wall, uh, painted on canvas, painted on wood, hung on the wall, um, 
photo taken, printed off, framed nicely. Like the way to then um, make money off of that is a little bit easier for those artists than maybe somebody who is a digital first artist or a conceptual artist that does installation work. Um, so an NFT could be a great way to make money as that kind of artist. Uh, the art that I am showing right here on the screen is Rafik Anandal, um, whose work is just mind blowing to me. He does very uh, large, beautiful machine learning um, generated works of, of art that these are called machine hallucinations. They take, um, they scan across the internet, everybody's uh, you know, like these are all from New York specifically, like everybody's photos of like a specific point in New York and the, the machine learning kind of makes them into one living, breathing um, image uh, and it's gorgeous. And so um, I got to see his work in person at Art Tech House in New York and it was a room that had projection mapping all over it and you just kind of laid there and took in this 30 minute experience of visuals and sound um, and it was gorgeous and so okay that's cool how how is he going to make money off of that um well i mean he's he's a great artist he's definitely getting grants and places like our tech house i'm sure are paying to show his work but he can also create nfts and that kind of captures a moment of that experience that i can then enjoy anywhere i want that i own and so that's how he can make work it's also an opportunity to collaborate with others. I think the arts community in general is in a massive collaboration community, right? Um, whether you are working in a studio space or um, like an artist studio space like Chrome Edge or 400, even if you have your solitary studio, you're surrounded by other artists and you might pop over and ask them a question about how they're managing a certain type of material or, hey, could you come over and critique this work for me? Art spaces are highly collaborative. And I think that this is an opportunity for you to explore your big dream work of art by collaborating with others, not just other artists. Um, potentially you have a concept obviously, and maybe you wanna animate it, but you're not an animator. You can reach out and work with an animator, but also um, developers, right? People who are out there coding projects who are, or marketers, people who are out there who want to help you market your project. So it's a, also an opportunity to potentially work with other brands. Um, there are plenty of brands out there now who are working with artists um, to create the visuals for their NFT project. Um, there's a lot around um, the gaming NFT space where you know, they hire artists out to then help them create the visuals for their project. My big disclaimer here, not every NFT project is gonna to go to the moon. Not every painting that I paint as an artist is going to sell um, or certainly not selling for the amount that will keep me afloat for the rest of my life. Uh, but I think a lot of successful projects here do require some marketing, right? And any traditional artwork also kind of requires some amount of marketing or at least someone to, um, to be a patron on behalf of your work and to put your work out there and uh, alert others. Um, I think simply listing your work on an NFT marketplace like OpenSea, it's not going to be just an easy payout for you, um, but kudos if it is. Uh, please let me know if that happens for you. I want to celebrate you. Um, but it does, it does require a bit of, of work, right? Um, if you have your own following already, uh, the best thing that you can do is begin onboarding them a bit to your concept of wanting to do NFTs. Um, I do, it's not an easy not an easy community out there necessarily to to bring with you on that journey and you're going to maybe fall in with some folks who are dissenting and um question why you're going into nfts so the best thing to do is really take a moment to self-reflect and analyze why you want to get into this and be honest with your community as well um, i think honesty and uh, goes very 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 well in this space and I think that plays into blockchain itself, right? Blockchain is very open, it's decentralized. Um, people have access to it and can review it anywhere. And that kind of plays in along the lines of your collector community as well. They wanna hear from you and they want you to be honest about your reasonings.
All right, here's another misconception about NFTs. Uh, I've heard NFTs are nothing but ugly MLMs or Ponzi schemes. Okay, well, again, I think that your concerns are quite valid. Um, not every NFT out there is aesthetically pleasing to me as a collector. That's, I think, the best way I can put it. Um, and it's okay to say that they're not your aesthetic either. Uh, I think it's easy to focus on sort of the bad and the ugly um, when all the good work out there is still being developed. Again, we're very, very new to this space right now. And so you are going to have a lot of projects, um, PFP style projects, and I'll go into PFPs here in a moment, um, that focus on just uh, generative work that ranges upwards from 10,000 images. The whole concept of these, to some extent, is speculative. It is to pump and dump. Um, however, we were just talking about Rafiq Anandal's um, machine hallucinations, and that is not this, right? That is a different type of work that's serving a different type of purpose for a different type of audience. So you got to think about your audience and your collectors as well. So there's, like I said, there's a different kind of NFT for every artist out there um, and a different type of way to explore NFTs. So I'm going to go over four different ones, and maybe this might spark some interest for you. This might spark a sense of inspiration for you. So the first type is a one of one. Um, the most famous one of one NFT work that is out there right now is uh, Beeple's Every Day's The First 5,000 Days. Um, this is the one that had like record breaking auctions uh, at an auction house. I want to say it was $69 million that went for this NFT. It's a one of one. There's only one that exists out there. Um, there are IRL examples of one of one works. So we're talking about like original paintings or sculptures. Your audience here is going to be your core collectors um, and traditional arts investors as well. These are people who are interested in art for the sake of art. Your primary sales can be quite high and depending on your success as an artist, they could be, your secondary sales could potentially be even higher. There's also generative art editions and generative art. Um, I don't feel like I need to explain too much to a room full of artists out there, but just in case anybody needs a quick refresher, generative art has been around for a lot longer than NFTs and a lot longer than the internet. The concept here is that you take a little bit of the human creation out of it. Um, you might use an algorithm or a machine to help you create parts of this work. Um, this one that you see right here is actually called autoglyphs. It was the first on-chain generative art um, that actually uh, kicked off in 2019. So that means that the art generated as people were minting it um, and it is uh, lives on-chain. Um, that means a little, a little technical side here. Um, not all of the work, visual work, not all of the visual work uh, lives on-chain. Like, can be accessed on the blockchain. It's usually being pointed to another website or another URL. And that's where like the GIF or the JPEG lives. Um, but the generative art itself actually lives on chain. Um, so some IRL examples of this potentially could be like unique works of art within a series. Um, your audience can be collectors who don't care about speculating on the market um, and fans who want to support you as an artist. Uh, so these are people who are into that high concept work and are interested in art for art's sake again. So addition runs, um, you can be small and your primary sales might be a little bit more accessible to begin with, especially because people really won't know what it is that they're getting until they mint it. Um, and your secondary sales could see a little bit more uh, influx in cash. Um, all depending on the success of the project and um, your notoriety as an artist. There are also additions. Um, this is done by local artist Adam Hernandez. Um, this is a numbered or limited time open edition and which are all visually identical. Um, he has his God Mask Gang series out, um, all of which are one of one, except for one series that is an edition of 500 and that's this one right here. Some IRL examples of that can just be physical collectibles or your open edition prints. Um, your collectors who can't afford original artwork, uh, but they still want to own something from you as an artist, this would be your main audience. Um, edition runs can be small to mid-range and your primary and secondary sales aren't going to be 
a ton of money, but it could be a great way for you to test the waters and see if this is something that you want to dive into. And of course, after that, there are PFPs. Um, these are profile picks. That's what PFP stand for. They're one of like an X collection. So it can be one of 10,000, one of 5,000. Um, it's big. Edition runs can be very large. Um, they're usually seen as that highly speculative market uh, or highly speculative investment, right? So utility, this is when you get conversations about utility and roadmap um, and community tend to fall in with the PFP projects. Um, they can be club memberships, Kickstarters, angel investing as your sort of IRL uh, correlation here. Things that don't necessarily have art tied to them, um, but this is a way for art to be tied or like there's a visual representation there. Um, your like hype beast collectors, investors, and early adopters are going to be interested in this style of work. Um, the addition runs, again, like I said, are quite large. Primary sales tend to start very low. Like this is I'll be honest, most of the NFTs I own um, are considered PFP style NFTs, the like one of 5,000, one of 10,000 works um, that I was minting for 0.07 ETH at the time, which at the time of minting them was about $300. So that's about, you know, like that's as an art collector, not just physical collecting, but also digital collecting. That's about like for the most part, my cap on, on collecting a piece. Um, so for me, the digital collection, um, that's kind of where I put my market cap on. However, secondary sales, this is where you kind of like have the go to the moon thing where you can really see um, as an investor, as a collector, your collection gain value. And what the artist gets out of that is all dependent on what's in that smart contract that I talked about earlier. So what does the artists get percentage on the secondary market sales. So we're gonna wrap up here momentarily so that I can attempt to answer any questions, but I also wanted to point out that, um, yeah, some, some folks just like collecting, right? So I enjoy collecting and I've been collecting um, not only works of art, but just collecting things in general since as far back as I can remember. I have an amateur coin collection. I have a, a gemstone collection. I have physical artwork collection. So um, Deanna Arona, who's also another local artist, um, I have a collection of his physical work, as you can see here. And I also have a, one of his NFTs, a digital work of a Daniel Arona piece as well. So I enjoy collecting. I want to support artists. That's why I get into it. There are also NFTs out there that are for good, right? So some projects exist purely for market speculation. Um, but others do exist to do good in the world as well. So if you are looking to create a project or if you're looking to um, sign on as the artist for a specific project, again, like I mentioned, sometimes it's not about you thinking about the PFP project and having to do it all on your own. It's about being the artist that then gets used for a larger project. Maybe you wanna find one that speaks to your values as a human. Um, some of the ones that are out there, uh, like World of Women, um, that's the image that we see here. They've donated a percentage of primary sales to three different women-focused charities. And additionally, they have held auctions um, after their projects all large degree of success that then also donated back to charities. There's Change DAO, um, which is, they focus on people, planet, profit. So a lot of their NFT projects will make sure to be um, environmentally conscious in some way, that they put people and planet first ahead of profit. There is Women Rise NFT, um, which looks to bring more inclusivity into the Web3 spaces. Uh, there's ArtXV, which um, supports neurodivergent artists. Meta Angels, this is one that I'm actually in. I really enjoy it. Um, they do things like Angel Grants, um, which is a no strings attached, grant that happens um, weekly for members of their community, that is members who hold their NFTs, and that is voted on by the community. So again, like giving you some concept and ideas about that community aspect of NFTs. They also are uh, work with Adobe Artists in Residence to produce uh, NFTs as well. And a new one that I started looking into a little bit is called Betwixt. And it's sort of a gaming NFT um, that explores mental wellness through series of generative NFT works. So kind of um, there's several mental health and mental awareness uh, 
NFT projects out there, which I think is a really interesting space because I'll be perfectly honest with you. I started in this industry in September and we are now in July. I got to say by February, I was feeling major burnout. Um, I'm not so much anymore, but uh, yeah, it's tough to keep up in this space. Um, just like it is tough to keep up in any sort of, um, you know, I think as an artist, we all feel burnout at some time. So I, I really like that there is a focus too on, on mental health. So you want to make an NFT, um, you'll need an idea. So you create art, maybe you have a concept, maybe you want to gather a team, maybe you need to find a developer out there to help you. Then there's also marketing. Um, you want to educate your community and bring them along on the journey with you. They, especially those who are already a part of the NFT space, might be interested in following your work, might be interested in supporting your project because they're interested in seeing you as a traditional artist um, and your journey through Web3. And then also you have to think about the tech as well, the crypto wallet and the platform that you want to mint or sell on. All right, that's cool. Maybe you don't want to make an NFT. You just sat through the last hour. You're like, that's nice. Thanks, Lisa, but this isn't for me. Totally get it. Respect. Thank you so much for sitting in. Um, that's totally okay. So um, I'm going to go, maybe you're interested more in protecting your art, right? There's some conversations out there about, um, I'm a digital artist. I don't want to make NFTs. How do I protect my art? Um, so First and foremost, like any any of the misconceptions that we talked about or any of the, the things that we mentioned that were sort of, um, you know, dissenting opinions on NFTs, be vocal. Be vocal and advocate for change in the industry. But I also hope and encourage that you do so with, with sort of um, an open heart as well and with uh, kindness and gentleness. Um, I think that a lot of these conversations about NFTs can become quite heated and that's not, that's not changing anybody's mind on either side. Um, and so again, that space in the middle where we can come and have an open dialogue and communication about some of the benefits and pitfalls of NFTs um, then allows for uh, just more community building and a better understanding of, of artists and creators and, and collectors as well. Um, you can file a Digital Millennium Copyright Act takedown notice against any site that is selling your work as an NFT. Um, I know it's obnoxious to do so, but you know, unfortunately right now you have to be the advocate for yourself on that. Um, you can also add watermarks to any work that you post online um, and in, including Instagram. Um, and then uh, if you do sell an NFT, by the way, you are not transferring or assigning copyright to the buyer unless you specifically say so. Um, they don't automatically own the image or copyright. Um, I think one of the interesting things uh, is this board Ape Yacht Club. Uh, the I, the um, by owning it, you actually do own some rights to then create something out of it, uh, which is why we saw board Ape Yacht Club uh, like burger stand out in LA um, and folks that are forming bands using their board Ape Yacht Club things, and so. Um, you don't automatically, if you do decide later that you want to sell an NFT, just know you're not selling your rights away um, unless you specifically say that the person or the collector can then do something with your work. Mostly, biggest takeaway, I hope that you take away with us today, is that you know, like we're still really early. We're really early. Um, you're allowed to change your mind. Um, or you can stay the course uh, with your traditional mediums. Uh, both are super respectable and I respect your decision on either case. Um, uh, going back to the very beginning of this conversation, I was asked, um, you know, is this a passing fad? Uh, I would say my feelings on PFP projects right now are that, uh, yes, they are kind of a passing fad, um, but NFTs as a whole, um, the concept of using NFTs as another tool in your creative toolbox, I don't think that's going away. I don't think that we can put that one back in the box. I think that one's out and it's going to be the next several years of artists exploring, brands also exploring what does Web3 look like? What do NFTs do? Um, and so strap in, it's gonna be a wild ride. <laughs> So thank you so much for listening. And I think I left some time for questions. Um, I will do my best to um, 
not share the screen anymore. <laughs> I will do my best to answer any questions um, to the best of my ability, but please be aware that I might not have all the answers. Um, that's okay. Uh, we're all still very new in this space. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was very informative. Um, I learned quite a bit, um, which actually sparked so many more questions for me. So now I have my own research to do. Um, with that sentiment, um, I guess I will go ahead. I don't see any current questions in the chat. So I'll go ahead and ask a question. And then if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand or put it in the chat and we'll go ahead and go forward with that. So my first question, um, I don't believe there's a right answer to it, but I'm the kind of person who digests information better with analogies. So with all of this information, um, would you say that the NFTs right now are for 2D art? Um, this is kind of like the transition, if I could imagine being back in the day when music was on records and it switched to streaming platforms. Um, would it be something somewhat of that kind of concept? Like I know like you have the main one um, and then like there's many copies, um, whereas with music, you will have the masters. But like when you pay for like a subscription or you pay for a song on like Apple Music, um, there's that little thing that contributes to that master, but Apple doesn't necessarily own that song. You don't necessarily own that song. Um, oh. Would you see that as something kind of similar? Well, I think what you drew a correlation to, which is really interesting, and this is what I'll kind of half answer with, is that um, I would see the uh, correlation between records and streaming and um, let's say traditional 2D art and NFTs to be the, uh, the creator receiving um, their fair share of royalties for their work kind of, right? And mm -hmm. I would say that um, we only touch today on visual art NFTs, but music NFTs are a very real thing and they are becoming right. like, um, definitely more people are focusing now on uh, like taking a look at music NFTs as potentially this next big movement in the NFT space because even more so um, creators are able to get more royalties out of, um, out of that, like, right? So like with your Spotify's um, streaming services, what, like, I, I don't even wanna guess like what, what few cents each person gets out of that streaming, but I think it's still like a step up maybe from what like records were, um, but I think NFT music is going to be even um, a bigger opportunity for those creators to receive uh, like royalties and receive their sort of um, share of the market. I hope that yeah. sort of answered a little bit of your question. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I do have a question in the chat and it says, can NFTs only be for art images or can it be for music? So you just answered that. Um, would that also include dance videos? So is this a, a umbrella for basically artists reclaiming um, their space and what they deserve when creating their art basically? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, that's a great question. So um basically anything at this point i feel that you can cre be considered creative um can be in a space an nft so yes um music we just mentioned music nfts are becoming a new big thing um the there is something called a proof of attendance protocol which uh exists sort of in the metaverse spaces i know i feel like this whole conversation could be like five hours long um just because there's so much to dig into with web3 but People have heard metaverse tossed around a little bit um, before Facebook decided that they wanted to stake their claim on metaverse. Um, there's something called proof of attendance protocol, which is essentially uh, a ticketing system, right? Or like a way that you prove that you were at an event in the metaverse and that is an NFT. And that can unlock a whole bunch of different things as well. Um, there are fashion NFTs are becoming very big too. Uh, like a lot of these traditional fashion houses, um, like the big ones, um, are exploring NFTs in the sense of like outfitting your digital avatars. That's huge, right? Like think about the way that we collect work in the physical world to be seen um, as we spend more and more time in a digital world. 
Like we'll also want to make sure that our aesthetic is seen and appreciated by people. So like, yeah, we're going to want the Louis Vuitton, you know, uh, bag to go with our digital avatar and they are working on those kinds of spaces. Um, mm -hmm. So video is definitely something that also can be explored. Um, as far as the mechanics of how to make sure that say like a three and a half minute video is accessible to somebody uh, is going to be slightly out of my wheelhouse, but I do, I do know that that is a space that can be explored and then writing as well. Um, there is a sort of new web three style blogging platform um, that is sort of uh like you can create nfts out of your your writing and collect royalties based off of that sort of collection as well so um yeah and i think i'll go ahead and address one of the criticisms is that uh this is just us trying to make a market out of everything and capitalize uh like this is capitalism at its worst but as creatives you know why shouldn't we try to get paid for our work right i think um unless your unless your work is you not making money which could be part of your artist statement 100 percent, and i respect that uh there we we all need to make a living and this allows us to do so yeah nice let me check the chats really quickly um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to come off the mic. Okay, I have another question. Um, yes. So, oh, uh, please go ahead, Chino. I am uh, concerned about content, the range of content that might be incorporated. Where is, is there a line drawn? Is there taste? Is there X-rated or the, in, other, in other words, what is content? How is content regulated if it is in fact regulated? I'm sorry, Chino, can you repeat that just a little bit louder for everyone to hear? How, how is content regulated if content is regulated? Oh, that's a, I mean, that's a very good question. Um, yeah. I would say that on certain third party platforms, potentially like OpenSea, that's a big one. Um, there might be some content moderation that occurs. Uh, we're talking about um, things that might be questionable or offensive to some viewers. Uh, however, there is no overall content moderation when it comes to creating an NFT because anybody can, again, create one and put one out there. It's whether or not you're using a third party platform to do so would be maybe where some of the moderation does take place. Part of that is, yeah, it's it's an odd celebration of um, the decentralized and open nature that is blockchain, but also uh, as an as somebody who was a practicing artist for a while and still considers themselves a supporter of the arts um, and worked at an arts uh, college for a while too, like. I can tell you that uh, that conversation about what, where is the line between art and say pornography or art and something that is truly distasteful uh, is really, um, you know, the market decides, right? And if somebody buys that work, whether it be physical work, like an actual IRL piece of work or an NFT work, um, you know, that to that person, it could be art. And I think that the larger philosophical discussion would be like, who are we to decide that it isn't? Um, it's like some art philosophy right there. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. So Lisa, from the point of a collector, I would like your idea, um, your thoughts on this kind of NFT physical art abomination I've been brewing up recently. So I have a friend who's an engineer and he's like really, really good with like LED screens and everything. And we were sitting around the other day thinking about what's a way to really come into this space and disturb it, but also just confuse everybody. And this idea that we've had is to um, somehow I will stretch a physical canvas, add physical like in your hand artwork to it, but then there will be a um, 
almost like just a, a small screen. We don't know. I don't know how big of a screen I will have in it yet, but a screen that displays an animated version of this painting or something like that. As a create, as a collector, would that be something that you'd be interested in seeing integrated into the space? Yes, yes. Thank you so much. You actually were touching on a term that I did not throw into this uh, slide deck in, in time. Um, there's a new term that's kind of being tossed around a lot called fidgetal which is the cross between physical and digital. Um, and there are some folks that are exploring this sort of, uh, how do we create a bridge between physical, uh, tangible items and sort of their digital counterparts in NFT spaces. So as a collector, as an artist, um, I would love to see you continue to explore that. I think that that honestly, um, from being in the industry now for a little while uh, would help some people kind of grasp a little bit more the concept of value of the work, right? There's, it's sometimes like, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna assume that we're safe in a room full of artists right now. We know that um, it can be tough to get somebody to understand the value of a physical work of art that you've created. And then the extra jump of now trying to get them to understand the value of something that lives digitally uh, can be even harder. So what you're doing is creating this digital item that allows that sort of bridging to kind of happen where it's like, um, oh, I still have like this, this physical thing that I can hang on my wall or that I can admire um, in IRL in the real world, as well as sort of a NFT that exists that, you know, I can show off anywhere that I'm at, right? So I'm, please, I think that's cool. Please explore that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Nice, I have another question in the chat. So it said, along the same lines in this conversation, is this like the artist taking control, say like the Ticketmaster monster? Like instead of getting a third party cut, uh, they take a huge cut and now, this, now artists get the bigger cut they deserve. Um, I'm a slow processor and I just need additional analogies, LOL. Yeah, no, that's a great, <laughs> that's a great analogy. That's actually a pretty decent one. Um, yeah, uh, so, just like Ticketmaster taking a like, massive cut. And actually um, going off of that, there are sort of NFT ticketing services that are starting to pop up. There's one called Yellow Card, which is worth exploring. Um, they are, uh, I, I use them for a ticketing event for like an uh, NFT NYC event uh, last November. And the ticket exists as an NFT through yellow card, um, which then like was cute, transformed into something else on the phone once it was scanned um, at the event. But you know, like they, that fee is gonna be a lot less. It is, you know, taking out the, the ticket master, but to go back to the analogy, yes, that, that is a great analogy to use. Um, even in traditional gallery spaces, like to, to once again, tie this back to how artists might um, experience selling their, their physical works. Uh, you as, a, as an artist might be working with a gallery, the gallery takes a 50% cut, you know, sometimes, or at least a lot of the New York galleries. Um, a lot of the galleries here in Columbus um, will take a little bit of a smaller cut, I think anywhere from 30 to 40%, but, um, you know, big New York galleries are taking a 50% cut of your work. And then you sell that work and it's in somebody's private collection. And later on they sell it maybe for three times the amount that they bought it for. You're ne you as an artist are never gonna see that money, right? You, you will not see that money on the secondary sales at all. But that smart contract thing, which is the thing that I'm, you know, I want artists to take with them when they have conversations, um, with potential developers or potential project people, that smart contract dictates what you as an artist can get on the secondary market that you don't have to like hunt down and manage anybody yourself. Because again, it's, it's, it's agreed upon already, it's executed by code. So you, maybe you put it in that you get 15% of all secondary market sales from here on out. You don't have to do anything. You just have to sit back and collect then on secondary market sales. Whereas, a traditional based artist, if they if their work sold on a secondary market, they're never going to see that like any royalties on that. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Um. I just have one more question. If no one else has a question, I think we'll be wrapping up pretty soon. Yeah, if I just state a comment, Devon. Yes, ma'am. 
Hi, um, hi, Lisa. Um, I have just a brief comment. I don't know. I, for me, I just wanted to get educated more about this new technology realm that's out there. Um, I do have a crypto. I, I began one as just you know just to see how things would go initially. So I just want to make sure I comprehend. Um, so when we sell or if we sell these NFTs. This is we are selling digital arts and we're getting digital currency back for the purchase. It's not physical, tangible money because that's how crypto is digital money, right? Correct. Um, you can take that um, digital money, that digital currency, uh, and you can uh, transfer it back to uh, US dollar. Um, it won't be like there will be gas that is associated with that, of course. Um, like I mentioned that uh, if you were at the beginning and I was going through some of the, the terminology, gas is that um, transaction fee that you pay to do a transaction. So as you exchange your ETH, say back to USD, you are going to experience a transaction fee. You are also gonna have to pay tax on that too. And I just want everybody to be aware as artists, um, I know sometimes taxes can be a little bit uh, scary for us. And I do believe if I want to plug GCAC, I think that you guys have done a tax workshop before. Yes, so yes. go to GCAC's website and um, like watch that as well, uh, or stay tuned for a future tax workshop by them. Um, you will have to pay tax on, on that earning. And I'm sure that probably is equivalent to probably how much you sold the piece for. Is that what dictates that? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And so, um, you know, some folks, will just keep that ETH, keep that like, let's say it was an Ethereum, they keep that Ethereum, that ETH in their crypto wallet and just continue to do purchases out of that as almost like a savings account. Um, you don't have to, you don't have, I'm not a tax expert, please do not quote me. Um, I am in no way a tax expert, this is not real advice, but I think if you just kind of like keep it as like a savings in there and you don't take it out, then like you don't have to stress until you decide to take it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm not a tax expert. <laughs> not, not financial advice. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Also, I see that Instagram tag up there. I'm going to follow you on Instagram. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, uh, if anybody else has another question to feel free to send me um, a DM on Instagram. I had it on this slide earlier. It's graphically Lisa. I can just put it here in chat as well for folks. Um, and I do wanna super thanks to GCAC again for letting me blabber on for an hour and a half about how excited I am about this new creation tool. <laughs> oh, we wanna thank you for taking the time to actually you know, help us understand and be a part of the the movement and the information um you could have easily was like you know i'm going to have this information for myself i'm going to be at the head of the curve so <laughs> definitely very appreciative that we have students like you that are in the field and researching and relaying that information back to us so big thanks to you lisa thank you i definitely um want to be sure that i remain uh just a place where artists can come and ask me questions and I'll tell it to you like it really is. Um, again, I'm not here to try and convince you to make one, nor am I here to convince you to start buying and selling NFTs. Um, I just think it's a really great tool for arts creation. Um, I'm really excited by the potential that exists out there. And so I kind of just want to make sure that people get onboarded in a very kind way. Um, not the spaces out there aren't always the kindest. So you try to be kind. Yeah, wonderful. Well, um, we are going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, I will follow up with everyone who was able to make it. Um, I will go ahead and link all the information that Lisa has given us, as well as uh, resources and her contact information too. You guys can expect to see that email in the next few days. Um, other than that, you'll be reaching out to Lisa or you can reach out to me to get to Lisa um, if you have further questions or concerns. But I want to thank everyone for making the time to get out here, especially um, after the little zoom uh issue but you guys were diligent and we made it through and i believe that we all benefited from this time that we had together um so everyone you guys take care have a great rest of your day and then lisa if you could stay on for just a second um before you go off and everyone take care bye all thank you thank you so much
Do we get this slide? Did you say that? Do we get an email of the slide, the presentation? Um, yes, I will go ahead and get as much information for you guys as well. I will ask Lisa if she can provide the slide as well for you all. Um, you guys can expect to see this in the next few days. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and I can go ahead and hit stop recording.